What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the Debbie Royale YouTube channel. Today, we're talking 2025 quarterbacks. So we are done with the draft class of 2024. Now we're looking ahead at the 25 quarterbacks, and it's going to be a mess. So just to be just to warn you out there, there is no consensus of the 2025 quarterbacks. They're across the board. Someone's one could be someone's eight. So we're going to go through our consensus rankings here. We just dropped our Debbie guide, and we just dropped a college manifesto that we do every year. So we're going to go through the consensus ranks i'm gonna look at eight guys plus some guys on the watch list who all have a chance of being kind of up there in terms of the quarterbacks going over scouting going over their stats but also going over advanced kind of stats from pff looking at that and just kind of give you an overview of who could be the best quarterbacks in terms of their nfl future right i know there are other guys out there like dylan gabriel these other guys that maybe could have a bow next type season but right now based on nfl potential who are the top 2025 20, quarterbacks that's what we're going to be doing on the show today. So let's start with Carson Beck, number one. Now, this guy is one of those one guys, you know, that could be consensus out there, depending on where you look. Most people have him as QB1 to QB3 in that range. He kind of came on last year, 3,900 yards. He had the 24 touchdowns, six interceptions, had the loss to Alabama in the SEC title game. But before then, looked the part, got better as the season progressed. He sat behind Stetson Bennett for those two years. So last year was his full first year. As a quarterback, When you what you see from him, so our strengths and then areas of improvements that we're going to talk about. Remember, these guys are young. We're not talking about weaknesses at this point. They're D1 athletes. Where are areas that they can improve on? So let's look at strengths first. Does really well in the pocket. I think he manipulates the pocket really well. I think he understands where pressure comes from. And I think that, you know, he can see the field really well as well. Now, ball placements there. He has some throws already that are NFL ready. He's got some throws on his tape that you're like, damn, he fit that into a number. You have to love what you see from him. He's got that going for him. And his off-platform throws, he throws great out of structure, on the run, cross body, to the numbers where he needs to go. Like, he does that well. Those are things that translate very, very well for his game at the next level. Areas of improvement. His mechanic struggles when he's under pressure. So he understands where pressure is coming from, and I think he does very good at post and pre, you know, post and pre read you know, snaps, understanding where to go with the ball. His reads are really well. I think that he knows he knows how to do those things. Now, the question is though, when he does get pressured, how bad are his mechanics? That's where he can kind of rush throws and do those things. Now, that might have just been based on lack of reps. He got the reps last year. We should see an improvement there. Decision making as well. So, like, hey, when he when when he did get pressured, you saw some errant throws, some turnover worthy plays, those type of things. Can he get better there? I think that's the big question mark that many have for him there. And in big game struggles, and really it's just one, right? The SEC title game. There was a couple other ones. The Missouri game was a little closer than what it should have been. But, like, what does that look for? He has a big game against Clemson, beginning of the year. How is he going to do there, I think, is what you have to look for of how he improves. Now, when you're looking at advanced stats, 91.5 offensive grade is really good. 3.8% big time throw. We like that. 2.3% turnover-worthy play, 66.1% offensive grade and pressure. Everything is there. Now, I think what people have for him and some very, very high you know, rankings out there for, from draft scouts, they have met QB1 based on potential. Like, hey, he was really good last year. Is he going to improve? Which these guys can. So that's where I think you're seeing the QB1 mantra come from. And that's probably where we have them there too, is we're projecting out. Like, hey, improved could be even better moving forward. Now, our number two guy is probably going to cause some controversy. But again, remember, we're talking Giants here. You might not like Drew Aller from Penn State. You might think that he is overrated. You might have him at seven. That's okay because maybe, you know, we're right-ish. Maybe you guys are right too, and he's in the middle there. That's the thing with this tier is that we don't really know. It's it's really development. Who? What are these guys going to develop here? And the thing with Aller is he still has the tools, right? 2,600 yards last year, 25 touchdowns, two interceptions. So, from the raw numbers, he looks okay. We're not talking about a disastrous year. We're just not talking about the year that many thought he was going to have, right? Many thought he was going to come out and people were going to be afraid to play Penn State. That was not the case. Now, when you look at it from a scouting perspective, his strengths, arm strength, he has tools. If you're going to build a quarterback in terms of tools and what you expect come out of high school, all it was the guy. Had arm strength, still has velocity. Very good off off platform throws. He and he doesn't do that as much as, as as he did in high school. But man, I still remember the throw that I watched him have. He rolled to his left, crossed the body, fifty yard rope in high school, and I was like, "Damn, this kid can play." He does that. He has those physical attributes to do that. Areas of improvement, though, 
processing. For some reason, his processing is, is a struggle. His post-snap processing, understand where he gets the football. He looks mechanical out there. It's just, just, just kind of like a robot, right? I think he struggles with that. Lack of big plays. Now, whether that's an offensive firepower problem, the la- the their inset, you know, what they do on offense when you look and they wind up in the wishbone. They got Singleton, Catron Allen, they have really good backs now. Um, and, and maybe that's really what it is. Maybe it's not so much of his fault, maybe it's just the lack of weapons that he has. But we don't see the big plays out there, and he is very inconsistent. He was very inconsistent last year. Um, when he played big games, and obviously they beat up on the weaker opponents, but Michigan, Ohio State, those big opponents, he struggled. Now, this year he gets Andy uh Kotonicki from Kansas, who's one of the best offensive minds ever. He's very, very good in, in college football. You're gonna see him really kind of elevate his his this offense. But will Aller be the guy, right? He struggled in his spring game. Now, Many at a point in the spring that he struggled. Yeah, and he did. I think they had 40 or 50 mile an hour wins. And really, are we really putting a lot of credence in the spring games? I don't know. I, I think that he can be good when you're looking at his advanced stats. You know, you love to see the big time throws a little bit more. But the turnover worthy play, at least he's not also throwing turnovers. I can live with that a little bit. I still believe in the talent, but I understand people's hesitation with him as being a top three guy. And I don't think there's any wrong answer there with these guys. Now, at three, we have Quinn Ewers, Texas quarterback, came back for a, uh, basically a senior season, uh, has has two years under his belt. Obviously, that first year he played for Ohio State, didn't play, then transferred to Texas. 3,400 yards last year, 22 touchdowns, six interceptions. Now, as you can tell, there's a growing theme with these quarterbacks. They're just not there yet, right? They have there's something in their profile that's just not ready. And for Quinn, when you're looking at him, the things that really stand out from a scouting perspective is strengths, arm talent, IQ. His IQ is phenomenal. When we're talking about knowing where to get the ball, post it, and pre-snap reads, those type of things. We love that about uh Quinn Ewers. He has that. He layers the football well when his mechanics are on the money. He can get it to every level of the field, the numbers on the outside. He does that well. Quinn Ewers does that very well. And he has the arm talent. He's always had arm talent. Dude's had arm talent forever. The problem that we see that, you know, when you watch the tape and you go through the games, his release mechanics struggle, um, especially under pressure. Like, there are times where his mechanics get off kill. He throws some bad receptions. He had some of the worst throws I've seen as Oklahoma State the last couple of years. Just struggles in those type of environments, too velocity can hit or miss, you know, able to get the ball out quickly to his guys. And he had a very good offense. That's the thing with Quinn Ewers. You know, you're talking a Adonai Mitchell. You're talking Xavier Worthy, B. John Robinson, uh, Roshan Johnson. This year, Jonathan Brooks before the injury, Jaden Blue, C.J. Baxter, Jatavian Sanders. Like, he's got guys. He's had one of the better offensive lines, too. Obviously, this year was a little bit better than last year. But, you know, he just hasn't had that 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 explosion that you like to see, right? You haven't had that production. Then you add the injuries in there. He's definitely dealt with some things. Also, Arch Manning is sitting back there who had a really good spring game. So there's all these things, these question marks surrounding him, right? We've seen quarterbacks like Quinn before. Uh, going in the SEC, you have a bright spotlight. What is he going to be, right? Offensive grade last year, 86.8 was fine, you know? But could Arch be that guy on his heels? We've seen quarterbacks like this in the past where, hey, they're competing. DJU, for example, K. Klubnik. You know, middle of the year. Oh my gosh, sit him. Now he's going to be in the transfer portal. Will that be Quinn or will Quinn step up? There is a ton of question marks about that. If he steps up, wins a few SEC games, we're going to be talking about Quinn Ewers being a top five guy. That's how much, um, that's how volatile it is. That's how volatile these quarterbacks are because the range of outcomes are all across the board here. Now, next guy is Jalen Mill Rowe. Now, Jalen Monroe is all across the board here. Some people love him. I saw a recent mock where he went 101 to the Carolina Panthers next year. Shout out, poor Bryce Young. And then I see some people say he's not even on the board. He can't be a first-round pick. So, really, I think it's in between. Last year was his real first year, 2,800 yards, 23 touchdowns, six interceptions. He had the, Obviously, he's the rushing upside, right? So, when we talk about Jalen Monroe from a scouting perspective. He's a playmaker. Strengths. Offensive system now is great. He's got Kalen DeBoer there. And, and when you're looking at what DeBoer just did with Michael Penix Jr., top 10 guy, 
you have to love that, right? So this playmaking skills are going to fit into that. I do think that we're going to see a little bit more run first options from the quarterback in terms of like their rushing attack. When Kalen DeBoer's system, you you know, th- I think it was Bud Elliott talked about it on the Cover 3 podcast, but when DeBoer has been basically the offensive play caller, when he's had a rushing quarterback, that quarterback has led his team in rushing yards. That could be Jalen Monroe this year, and NFL teams might love that. He's a big dude, right? He's at 220. He's a big guy. So you're seeing like you're hoping for an Anthony Richardson type year has that arm strength can get it out there. And he has some throws in his spring game. They're like, damn, this kid's got an NFL arm. The areas that he's got to improve that you're hoping the coaching staff can improve his mechanics. You know, I think he's a little bit raw there turnovers, you know, and he had some times where he's definitely holding that ball out when he's running kind of the fumbling issues as well and accuracy. And really the accuracy is driven by the mechanics and you hope that he kind of improves there, but he's definitely got to pull back on those turnovers, make sure that he's making good decisions with the football. Now, obviously when we're talking about Monroe too, from his advanced metrics looks really good. 9.1% big time throw is nothing to sneeze at. That's a hell of a stat for him that he he's kind of a gamer when it comes to that. 2.8% turnover worthy play, 51.7% offensive grade under pressure. The thing with Milrow, and and you really see this, the one read and go type of thing. Hey, I see my guy, he's not there. All right, I'm gonna go, right? And I'm just gonna go run and use my athleticism. That's fine. College it works and does that, but how well does that translate over to the NFL? I think that's the always the question. Like, what are these skills gonna translate there? I think athletically he will. Athletically, he's going to test out the roof, right? But does that arm go with it, right? Where is he at? Is he the Malik Willis type, the Anthony Richardson type? Is he in the middle? Is he Jalen Hurts? Where is that question mark for him? I think that's the question he's going to answer going in, but he's got a great system. He's got hell of weapons, especially true freshman Ryan Williams. If he comes off and pops off, you're talking about Monroe being a really, really good player. Now, at five, we have a guy that could be one at the end of the season. Jackson Dart, Ole Miss quarterback. I've, we've been very high on Jackson Dart. I've loved him since he's been at USC. He's one of my favorite quarterbacks to watch play football. There was question marks whether he was going to win a job last year, though. Came in and won it soundly with Lane Kiffin there. Twenty, you know, you saw the touchdowns there. You see the numbers, and he really solidified himself as the QB. Right, won eleven games for Ole Miss. Very, very solid. Some one of the best seasons in Ole Miss history from a strengths perspective. Arm strength is there. Velocity, tools, tools, tools. He's had tools since high school. You can't question that. Off platform throws too. So he can make all the throws. He can get all the he can get the ball anywhere he needs it to go. Now, areas of improvement, and this is always a, a testament to what Lane Kiffin does. Lane Kiffin is an incredible play caller, but he doesn't really let his quarterbacks do a lot of pre-snap reads. You'll see a lot of it is all driven by Kiffin. That's one of the reasons why like Matt Corral is struggling, I think, to find a role in the NFL is that his pre-snap reads was the same thing. So Will he have the confidence in Dart to give him pre-snap ability, right? Changing plays and doing these things. You saw that limitation. You've seen that two years in a row against Alabama. When the good teams come in, Lane does not give him the reins. Will he give him the reins this year? That's the big question he needs to answer. Decision-making as well. That could goes along with pre-snap reads. And needs to show he can take over a game. He does well against opponents that aren't they don't have good defenses or they're supposed to be. He struggles against teams that are good. Will he be able to beat this vaulted member, Texas, Oklahoma coming this vaulted SEC schedule that they got. They had a pretty cupcake schedule last year. I don't want to say cupcake, but it was a pretty winnable schedule. Now this year, will that be sustainable? What does that look like for Jackson Dart? Now, when you look at his numbers though, Hey, you like it. 91.2 PFF offensive grade. One of the better offenses in the country last year, really revamped the room this year. Got some wide receiver transfers. They lost Quinchon Duckins, but their offensive line is much better than it was last year there. 5.2% big time throw, worthy play, 2%, not bad. Under pressure, he got a lot better. Last year, that was in the 50s. Now he improved on that, right? That's not even really a weakness or a strength of his. They've done a good job of playing under pressure. You have to like that. Our QB6, Shador Sanders, going to cause a little controversy. Some people think he's a top five guy. Ask his dad on Twitter, right? That He's been going off on that a little bit. Some people don't think he's a, he's going to be a QB at all in terms of the first, second round. So he's across the board. Six might be too low or might be just right. He had a pretty good year last year when he wasn't running for his life behind that really, really bad offensive line for Colorado. That is the question mark with Shador. 
in my opinion, from a strengths perspective, accuracy is there. Post-snap recognition is there. He does a great job of a second, third, and fourth read. Almost too good of a job. We'll talk about that. But he he is actually a very cerebral quarterback. He knows where he needs to get the ball to. And if it's not there, he knows where it's going to be based on what he reads the defenses. He actually reads defenses really well. I think that's a part that people don't give him credit for. He does it. He's very good there. Ball placement's there. Able to get on the outside, those type of things. I love what he's able to do from that perspective. Areas of improvement, though, man, he struggles under pressure. Now, whether that was because Colorado's offensive line was such ass last year, he just had no opportunity to kind of really deal with that pressure. That's part of it. I think that's a little bit of half of it. He does hold on to the football a little bit, and I think that goes with post-snap recognition a little bit. He's so confident that he can get the ball to somebody that sometimes he holds on to the football and adds sacks, right? He's got to work on that. And I hate putting off-field issues on here. It feels like such a cheap shit thing to do. I didn't know what else to say here with this. It's not that he just seems like a very, very solid foundational kid. And you're not talking about legal trouble or anything like that when you say off field issues. I think what the question mark is for me, maybe I should put leadership there. You know, he's out here quote tweeting people and his former teammates and just giving it a bad look, right? Well, NFL teams care about that. I think they do. I think NFL teams will, right? I know Dion is his father and he has that, but that is something that he's going to have to shake. You know, can you be a good teammate? Are you going to be there for your guys? This year, he has to prove that, right? With the guys out there on that field, he's got to prove that and stay off social media a little bit. Um, from a from advanced stats, look, at, hey, 91.2 offensive grade, 5% big time throw, 1% turnover worthy play. But that big missed number, that red flag, offensive grade under pressure. He's got to fix that. Number seven is Connor Wiegman, a guy that I love. I love Connor Wiegman. You know, he, he was my QB1 coming into the class. Um, he was ahead of a lot of the guys. Uh, that you know were coming in this class really highly touted for me because I thought that he had the tools and tangibles. But as you see there, he's only played nine games the last two years. That's a problem. He's got to get on the damn field, right, and stay on the field because he has a shot. He's got the frame. He's got the size to really do it. You know, pocket presence is there, arm strength. And you know what? The spreadsheet boys are going to hate me when I say this, but this dude's a freaking gamer right? Leadership. Dude gets hit, gets up, can lead a squad, right? He's going to go out there and guys are going to play for him. Everybody raves about him, former teammates, coaches, all of that, that he wants to go out there and just play football. And you have to love that from a strength perspective. Now, areas of improvement, it's pretty simple. Reps, damn it. He's got to get the reps. He's got to play out. He's got to finish the season out, right? Healthy. Injuries have been there. And in offense, this is now his, basically his third offensive system. Um, you know, Mike Eck will come over there from um, Duke and again, what Mike Elko was able to Elko, Elko, I don't know why I can't say that, was able to do with Riley Leonard is improvement. Hey, okay, he's got that quarterback background. Maybe he can do that for Connor Weegman as well. Now, from just the numbers, again, small sample size, 4% big time throw, 2% turnover worthy play. Obviously, great under pressure was great, though. He makes throws just getting absolutely tagged in the backfield. You have to like that from him, but he's got to get on the field. Now, number eight is the wild card. This kid could be QB1. I mean that because he's got freaking talent. Garrett Nussmeyer is a stud, right? He has been good. He's he sat behind Jane Downey the last two years. They've really wanted him just to develop and do that stuff. A lot of guys think they are QB1. You know, Andy Pham's doing a lot of fantastic work for us over on our sub stack here at TDR, and he loves him. I believe he is his QB1 there, and this is probably too low for him. Uh, I think casuals might not know who Garrett Nussmeyer is, but us, we we do know who he is. Um, strengths, really good pocket presence, arm strength, leadership is there. Um, they rave about that, and he's a different quarterback than Jaden. I think everything I've been seeing from the spring reports and everything, like, hey, he's been really rallying the troops, getting behind him. Um, very, very pocket quarterback S, but strong and push the ball downfield. There's a chance they have a better offense this year. Then with Jane Daniels, I know it's blasphemous to say because he just won the Heisman, but I think from a just from just an offensive perspective, Garrett could give him that. Um, he's got to improve his decision making. The one thing that they talked about was that he just he's a gunslinger. He's gonna let it fly, and that's why I like him. But that's also why he gets in trouble sometimes in terms of interceptions, and he definitely lets it go. Release has got to get a little bit quicker. They've talked about that in camp and in the limited reps. We know that, you know, when we're looking at his advanced numbers, that all comes from a limited reps perspective. But the one thing we keep hearing out of camp is just how great he is, how great his arm is. Look, he made great throws in the, uh, the spring game. Excuse me. This is a kid who definitely could rise up boards there. Now, after all those guys, those top eight, here's some other guys. Now, you might not see some people on there, you know, you know, but Riley Leonard, Notre Dame quarterback, he's on the operator prospect. Will Howard going to Ohio State, more of a runner, 
but maybe he pops off if Ohio State has a great year. Noah Fifida, like he could be that guy for Arizona. Maybe he goes. I know he's smaller in stature, but if they if they make a run in the playoff and him and Tim McMillan do well together, could be the guy. K. Klubnick, will he bounce back from Clemson, former top three guy? Preston Stone and Cameron Ward still also at Miami. These are guys that all could play a role. And there's other guys on here, you know, the older guys, the Dylan Gabriel types that people don't think about, but maybe they are just those guys that pop off this year, similar to Bo Nix, similar to, um, you know, Michael Penix Jr. and those guys there. So that's our 2025 quarterbacks. Those are our top eight based on consensus. Obviously, hey, we might be wrong. Let me know in the comments, you know, be respectful, but where are you at? Who do you have as your top five and why? Or what guy am I too high or low on? And tell me why. I love um, conversating with you guys. I know I haven't been on YouTube for a while. I had some personal things I had to take care of, but now I am back. So I appreciate you guys tuning here to the channel. As always, appreciate everything that you guys do. Check out the Patreon. Check out the Discord. Go check out the Debbie Guide. Uh, we just released that. Rankings, mock drafts, who we like based on that and help you guys out in your Debbie League. So appreciate you guys. I'll check you guys next time.